another episode of Carpool. Now, each week I give someone interesting a lift and we have a conversation. It's as simple as that. And this week's passenger is just gorgeous. I mean, what more can I say about her? She is absolutely gorgeous. She is stunningly beautiful, incredibly clever, wonderfully charming, and delight delightful company. Uh, many British viewers will have seen her on uh, TV shows such as Time Team and Coast. But she is so much more than a, t a TV presenter. She's a doctor. She teaches medical students all about the human body and how it works and what's gone wrong with it. And uh, she also studies ancient bones and she's, she knows all about uh, sort of the, the history of the human race. She is a truly extraordinary passenger and I'm really pleased that I managed to get her in the car and give her a lift down the local farm shop. So please welcome into the passenger seat the very lovely Dr. Alice Roberts. The one thing that I find annoying is the, that I don't mind it going beep to tell you in, you're in reverse, but it doesn't. It's like it's going on. Just shut up. Yeah. I know I'm in reverse. No, I know. But it does do. Oh, look at that. It does do that. Look, hold on. It it tells you what's behind you. Oh, that's. Oh, I could do that actually. I've reversed into <laughs> lots of things. I'm fine going forwards, but yeah, in my camper van, I've reversed into um, a police station. Oh, that's good. And the police are watching me doing it. <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> I reversed into my husband's father. Um, <laughs> a small country lane in Devon. <laughs> um, what else have I reversed into? Oh, I've reversed into trees and. Um, do you the the spatial because it is a it's a cliche, but there is I've had more than a little evidence of it over the years of the spatial awareness thing that i.e. some women do drive into yeah, you know yeah. very low level non-dangerous slow accidents my wife has driven a land rover through a garden wall not into it <laughs> she went straight through, through it, it and came in came into someone's garden well i have to say every time when i've actually reversed into something i haven't been concentrating right and i am quite clumsy and if i don't concentrate on things then things do tend to go wrong right because i remember my mum used to be amazed uh, when i was a teenager i started waitressing and she was amazed that I could waitress and not break things. <laughs> because you, at home, you hadn't got a good I would break record. things all the time. But obviously <laughs> I was concentrating at work. No, no, I'm because I'm, I'm clumsy with myself. My, I think because that's why I don't understand it. My own personal, I've got always got bruises there and there. Yeah. I walk into a door, into a door with my shoulder, and I go, well, I'm, <laughs> no, I've always been this. Where it is, I haven't they? suddenly got wider <laughs> in the shoulder area. No, why no I find I? it very annoying that door handles are exactly level oh, with you bash where, your your, hips? where your hips wow. are in the front. There's this bit of your hip called the anterior superior iliac spine, which is the sticky out bit. Oh yeah. <laughs> on the front. Oh, I'm glad you know what it's called. Um, you know what it's called. <laughs> Being an anatomist. Yes. yes. And um, it is just level with door handles, and right. I'm always hitting them. Well, and again, I should know where they are. You know. Yeah. They've, they've always been there. So could you tell from a, a <laughs> an ancient skeleton whether someone was has been clumsy <laughs> in their life? <laughs> well, you can on some bits of the skeleton actually, because I, I mean, I think it's quite interesting. If I run my fingers down the front of my shins. Right. Um, I can feel all these little lumpy bits because you have this kind of blade-like oh, front yes, I've got that. to your tibia. Yeah. From all the back. All so the... that's actually in the bone then, those lumps are? Yes, it is, yeah. Because <sighs> when, you, when you damage the lining on the bone, uh, it reacts by producing more bone. So right. it produces produce little bony lumps all the way along. And you can certainly see those on ancient skeletons. Wow. And I think that most of them, I mean, sometimes it's infections, but I think that most of them are actually just bashed. Just from where they bashed into yeah. a rock in the cave. <laughs> Just clumsy people walking around. Yeah, because yeah, my shins are just a you know huge, massive scar tissue because I'm always bashing into. Yeah. I don't know how I've managed to do it. <laughs> I think I also broke my coccyx um, when I was in London and I was dancing on a table. And I... <laughs> <laughs> Can you actually because that's your, your little tail, <laughs> your tail, your tail yeah, remnant? Yeah. Because yeah. certainly, whenever as soon as children, I've noticed that with children, as soon as they've learnt the term coccyx. It becomes a very popular term. Yes. You know, and it's always they've always. Oh no, I've snapped my coccyx because it's sort of <laughs> slight. It could almost sound rude. Yes. So I, I want to know then you. So you about how you got to where you are now. You became a doctor. I did. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, are you like? Are you like a? Could you be in a GP's practice? Type um, of doctor? No, because um, GPs are um, just like any other specialism. Really, you have to you have to train for several years to be a GP. Right. Um, so I'd have to go back to being a hospital doctor and, and rotate through different specialties like um, 
medicine and surgery and you know perhaps a bit of um, gynaecology and right. psychiatry and you sort of rack up a few years of experience in different specialties right and then you can go and because what you've done then practice. is you've gone you've gone you've trained you because I don't know how I, I, although I know doctors and they've told me <laughs> <laughs> I've managed it's all to changed as well. It's all and it's all, also, changed it's all changed, isn't it? Years, but I mean, you yeah. can't. You, you, did you do that thing where you were in a hospital with a white coat on and a yeah. stethoscope around your neck? Yeah, 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 but not for very long. Right. I worked in the NHS for 18 months. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think that's as much stamina. But don't stamina. You, have to, but you have to train for bloody years, though. It's a long training, isn't it? Yeah, I did. Um, I trained for six years in Cardiff. Um, right and did an anatomy degree as well. Right. So I loved, I mean, I loved anatomy as an undergraduate. Um, and then I went off and did my house jobs, which was in the mid 90s, which is when the um, you know, oh, junior doctors were working ridiculous yes. hours. I mean, it wasn't unusual. Do I go, sorry, do I go straight, go straight on? on yeah. straight on. It wasn't unusual to work more than 100 hours a week. That was kind of fairly standard. Yeah. And when you did weekend on call, you'd kind of start at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, and then you could be basically up all night on Saturday night. You know, wow. might catch a few hours sleep here and there, and then the same on Sunday night, and then eventually you'd go home at about six o'clock on the Monday. <laughs> and then crazy, be back to work for... again on the Tuesday. Oh. <laughs> so. But for someone who's needs, you know, who's, you know, even if you were driving a truck, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't be allowed to do it. Yeah. Or, or digging a ditch in a road, you wouldn't be allowed. You know, just because no, you'll crazy. do something wrong, you'll chop your foot off or you'll crash yeah. the truck. Well, is it, is it Whereas you're looking after people, now? is it? I mean, that, yeah, so that yeah, doesn't yeah. happen anymore. I do no. remember horrendous stories of that. The, people I knew you know, the European Working Directive, which has kind of limited the number of hours people work, have right. been really good um, from that point of view. But it was um, a peculiar tradition. It was almost it, it it smacked of public school in a way of the six formers bullying the yeah. younger, you know the older yeah. dogs. Who, well, I bloody did it. Yes, absolutely. When I was your age. But the thing is, the thing is, you had these older consultants going, "Well, I did it when I was your age." But also, they were living in lovely sort of doctors' residences, right. and they got woken up with cups of tea and breakfast in the morning. Right. Which, <laughs> so you know, yeah. times have changed yeah. slightly. Yeah. But yeah, so that's kind of gone now. But that's yeah, I mean, it was like that when I was a junior doctor. Right. And I did, um, I did what was meant to be a six month teaching job and I was still doing surgery some evenings and weekends. Right. Um, but essentially teaching anatomy at the university, so in the dissection room, wow. um, to medical students in their first and second year. And it's something that a lot of young doctors do because it's a really good way of brushing up on your anatomy. Right. Um, and I just loved it. So I ended up staying, but it was very, um, it was, yeah, I didn't, I didn't sort of um, make a decision as soon as I started doing the job that I was going to step out of doctoring. Right. But my boss resigned about a month before the end of the job, so this lectureship came up, and I thought, well, that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. So I might just, uh, I might just do this for a couple of years. But that was eleven years ago. Right. So. <laughs> You're still doing. But um, yeah. so you lecture in what is your what what subject do you lecture in then, and what um, discipline? Well, mostly anatomy. Right. Um, and you know, anatomy mostly for medical students and right. dental students as well. Although obviously they concentrate on the head and neck, um, but I also teach uh, doctors a lot later on in their careers, which is really nice because it keeps me in touch with the clinical side of right. things. So, but it's quite scary sometimes when you're teaching surgeons and they go, "Oh, yeah, we're quite close to that artery when we do this, this and that technique and procedure." And wow! Like, oh, don't tell me that. Wow! <laughs> um, obviously, in the dissection room, you can, you know, you can you can really pull it apart. I mean, it's like being a mechanic and looking at a car engine. Right. You can, you really can sort of get a very good understanding of it by taking everything so, apart. So you're just dissecting a cadaver. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is it just, I mean, that because for your average lay person outside the medical, <laughs> you know, that I have seen a dead body now twice, which was my mum and dad. You know, and it was quite interesting to sit in a room with them. Yeah. You know, when they're dead, yeah. and I mean, also interesting that it wasn't them. You know, I completely yeah. understood that. Mm. You know that I was very sad, but then it wasn't them. It was, it was a body. You no, know, I thought that was interesting. When I saw. I mean, I, I, I'd been an anatomist for a while, and um, and then my maternal grandmother died, and and I, I had exactly the same sort of reaction to it. Really, you know, I went to I went to see her, and she was dead. Yeah. And uh, and it wasn't her. Yes. And it was sort of an object. Yeah. That was left behind. Oh, it's interesting. You had the same because you presumably mm. have seen more dead bodies than you poke a stick at. So it's not like. Yeah. You know, I think the initial shock for me was, oh my God, this! I think it's the first dead person I've actually yeah. been aware that I've seen. I, mean, yeah. I don't know. I mean, do I go? We go left. Go left. Here. We're just following this person with a mattress on their oh, roof. That's that strange. It's tied <laughs> on with, I hope, tied on with strings. I've been kind of holding back yeah. a bit just in I case think it's a bungee. <laughs> I think there is something holding it on. 
very strange. But that, so did you, I mean, when you, but that, well, that is just, I, I think lots of people who aren't in the med in medicine are intrigued by those first experiences and certainly mm. doctors I've spoken to, some of them said, oh, the first time I saw an operation, I did, you know, I fainted, I threw up, I did it. Yeah, but yeah. then you do get used to it sort of thing. I think, um... But when the first time you saw a body being cut open, a dead body being cut open, was it? Well, when I went to medical school, we are very careful with the students now, and we sort of, we spend a couple of weeks talking to them about their own feelings and the, right. sort of the ethics and the and the sort of legal framework as well, before we actually take them into the dissection room and, um, and start showing them dissected specimens. Right. Um, but when I went to medical school, was, as far as I remember, it was sort of the first day there, and you got to buy all your instruments, so all your scalpels and forceps and everything, and then you went straight into the dissection room, and you were basically presented with this dead body, and there were six of you to your body, and you had a manual, and it sort of said, cut here. And you really, <laughs> and at that time, you had never... No. You presumably cut up a bit no. of chicken in the kitchen, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And I'd, um, <laughs> I'd seen an autopsy oh, right. um, from a distance um, when I was, you know, sort of applying to medical school. But, yeah, it was the first time I'd actually been sort of in that close contact with the yeah. dead body. It was very strange. Um, and I think that, you know, I think people do find it weird. And I think, that, you know, it is weird. And, you, and it's one of the things that, as a doctor, you kind of have to... I don't know whether get over is the right word, but you have to somehow um, come to terms with it. And it's about coming to terms with death, but it's also about yeah. coming to terms with the body. And also cutting into somebody. There's something yes. that's very taboo, you know, well, you're almost viscerally wrong I mean, yeah, cutting you, into somebody. Yes, you shouldn't if you're having a nice cup of tea with someone, you're not really <laughs> expecting them to sort of cut you open. Yeah. <laughs> so in a weird, I mean, you have to go through this quite strange yeah. sort of psychological process, and I, it's probably different for everybody, but you go through this thing where you distance yourself from it so that you can do it, yes, so that you're not yes. having visceral reactions to it. But then, obviously, when you're operating on patients, you have to go full circle. So you've distanced yourself enough to be able to do that physical act. Yeah. But then you still have to have compassion and you still have to be viewing the patient as, as, a, a, as, a, person, as a whole person. As a person, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I saw my own on a CT scan. Yeah, I've had my brain that cool? MRI'd. Um, Is that what it's called? What's the, what's the big no, donut there's, thing? There's, well, there's two types. Oh. There's CT, which uses x-rays to right. produce sections through yeah and then there's mri which uses magnets oh, would you know have we gone past ah, it is that where we That's need to go it, yeah sorry brilliant <laughs> i meant to know where this place is it looks lovely <laughs> we'll we'll find somewhere safe to turn around i think there's a little rain to bed up here but uh oh because i don't know what i was in there i was in a sort of big white donut yeah and then i looked at the pictures on the screen of my brain which was quite cool no it's amazing isn't it yeah i was I, i'm always slightly worried when i have those things done because I mean I had that done for a television program right and I had various other things done like I had an MRI done of my pelvis and you sort of think oh I'm actually looking inside myself and there's a possibility that I might find something right. that I'm not well and you and also you because I could look at that pictures of my brain and if I had of the biggest tumor in the history of the whole universe I wouldn't have bloody known you know yeah. whereas you could look at it and go what's that little dark patch yes, there yes what's that <laughs> and why isn't it quite symmetrical yes. yeah oh god yeah which is sort of a bit worrying yeah um, no, it didn't. It didn't look too bad. It looked quite right my brain. <laughs> Did it? it looked... <laughs> I thought mine was a little bit. Mine looked a bit small and a bit loose. <laughs> but I had just been knocked out, so it was a bit. It was that's why they were. That's why they were doing it. I'm just trying to find somewhere sensible. As long as it was nice and symmetrical. I think it was. I think it wasn't. I've I've seen less symmetrical things. <laughs> I think the brain's amazing though, because it's sort of. Um, it looks quite unremarkable, and certainly when you're sort of looking at it in the dissection room and, you know, taking it apart and looking at it. Yeah. There's no real evidence that this is the most complicated so thing in the body. Yes. Because obviously the, you know, the things which are really going on are going on at such a tiny level. Yeah. yeah. So you don't get an impression of all these sort of no. millions of networks and interlinking all, cells no. and things. No, so it's on a very microscopic level, mm. all that stuff, isn't it? Mm. But that, I mean, the other thing I think is fascinating, I love all that stuff of, you know, the bits of stuff I've seen you do on TV about our history of... We made a reconstruction of the first European, which was interesting actually. Is it, because is it, it was, this place? I think it's this one, right. yeah. Which was interesting because it was from... Well, I say the first European, it's the first known European modern human, Homo right. sapiens. And um, my friend Richard Neve, he's a forensic reconstruction artist. Right. He works a lot with the police. Right. Um, made a reconstruction of this face, which was just amazing. Wow. You know, this is a face from 40,000 years yeah. ago. And it's the face of the, you know, the first European that we know of, um, that is us and not Neanderthals. Yeah. 
and um, and he made it in clay because that's how he works. And he he starts off with a plaster cast of the skull, and then gradually builds up these clay muscles. Right. It's all very anatomically correct. It's great, and uh, and he showed me this this head, and it was just wonderful. And it was quite interesting talking to him about it. It wasn't it wasn't terribly scientific um, the discussion that we had, but. I said to him, what was it like making this face? And he said, well, it was very interesting. And he said, one of the interesting things about it is that it doesn't seem particularly European. Right. There are sort of aspects of it which maybe are a bit African, sort of sub-Saharan right. African, um, other aspects of it which, which seem a bit Asian to him. And that's just his own experience of right. having done lots of reconstructions. Yeah. So he said, it's almost like a kind of generic face. And I said, well, you know, I suppose that's what we'd expect. Yeah. You know, the first European. And I also said, look, you've made it out of clay. I know you haven't finished it yet. But actually, we expect that the first people coming into Europe would have been dark-skinned, um, and that there were quite a lot. Of, there was it? quite a lot of activity on the internet about that. Wow. Going, I mean, from these people, you just think, gosh, you know, I've, I didn't realise I trod on so many. Do traits. you think from from white-skinned people saying? Yeah, yeah, from from people saying. <laughs> Are you saying I'm how black? dare? How dare Alice Roberts say that the first Europeans were dark-skinned? And it's like, well, it's not, I'm not saying it. That's, yeah. you know, that's. It's it's, it's pretty much a consensus view. Yeah. If you're talking about people who are coming up from much more tropical areas, yeah. then the natural colour of their skin would have been much I, mean, I suppose if you're so. of, of, of a... I'm trying not to be judgmental in the way I'm saying it, but of a very fundamentalist Christian viewpoint, mm. then God made us white. Yeah, <laughs> you I, mean, know, I suppose a, you can go like that. It's interesting, because it goes back to kind of Victorian ideas. Yeah. Of, you know, the... And, and, it, and I suppose it's about evolution as well, isn't it? Because it's about the sort of um, the fact that I mean, I don't like the word race because it doesn't make sense biologically, and it kind of brings together lots of bits of culture. Well, that's what I think. Well. That's what I love about it. Because mm. is that the case then? Essentially, it's a lot of it's it's a purely political construct, isn't it? Race. It is, it's got yeah. nothing to do with yeah. anything else. Yeah, it's kind of politics and culture and and biology all mixed up together. Right. So biologically, you can talk about different populations, but of course, um, the populations all merge into one yeah, another. Yeah. So it's, you know, we're, we're all part of this big branching bush yes. of humanity. And it is all, um, I mean, and that, because that's what's so hard to understand briefly, but I mean, it, it, the, the general consensus of opinion is that tree, the, the roots of that tree are in uh, Eastern Africa somewhere. Yeah, probably, so, yeah, Eastern or Southern Africa. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's it. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it is amazing to think that we have this global species. Yeah. Um, but if you and it and it kind of makes sense if you think about it because if you think about a, you know um, even a you know a family that has a you know similar surname and have spread all over yeah, the world yeah. you know that you can trace that family back, back and to very you know, few eventually people. you're going yeah. to have a common ancestor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the amazing thing is that you can do that now with genetics with the entire right. human population right. of the world right. and go back to you know a few people living in Africa. Because why does because the other thing that I always find interesting, which I've talked to my kids about, is that if there were half a dozen people that crossed the Red Sea and came up into Europe. Mm. Yes, my, my, my daughter said, didn't that mean that brothers and sisters had children? And I was going, I don't know, probably. <laughs> Slightly, I, think, I mean, yeah, 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 I mean, there, I think at any point, I mean, there were times when the population crashed um, and would have been, you know, sort of in the in the region of a, a, of a few thousand people. Right. Um, but that's that's kind of the population levels that we're that we're talking about. Although actually, yeah. um, talking to some of the geneticists that we're working with on the series, they did think that the number of people that actually sort of came out of Africa around the Red Sea, right, um, and were therefore the ancestors of everybody else outside of Africa, um, was perhaps a few hundred people. Wow, which is amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Isn't it? yeah. But then so they're coming from a much bigger population, so they're not necessarily that close. No, they might not all have been related. Yeah. I think I should reassure my daughter yes. that that's not necessarily <laughs> the case. And also, when we trace back the genetic lines, um, you're only seeing a few of the genetic lines that were there at the time, because some of them would have become extinct. Right, right, so, yes. So all the genetic lineages that are in us today are not all the ones that would have been there 200,000 years right, ago. Right, right, yeah, so yeah. So we are sort yeah. of missing some age. Right. Yeah. What, and how long ago was that then, est roughly, when the, the, those few hundred people? Um, there are varying estimates, um, and I think it's probably safest to say that it was between fifty and eighty thousand years ago. And there are some geneticists who who are very much towards the younger right. age range, end of the age range, so about fifty thousand years ago. Right. And then there are others like Stephen Oppenheimer who are arguing for a, um, an earlier migration, right. about eighty thousand years ago. Um, but what is remarkable is that in 80,000 years, if you compare someone from 
central China to mm. someone from Ireland to someone from Africa. Yeah. That's quite that you know that right, that change in the human, the, the the just the initial. I mean, you know, clearly there's no one with eyes beneath their mouth. That would be no. a big change. <laughs> yes. Or ears yeah, on top of, of their heads. Yeah, we're all kind you know, of the same. The no, same model. It is ninety nine percent identical, but the t little things that are different are have happened in an incredibly short period yeah. of time. Really. Well, that's one of the other remarkable things about humans is that we are one of the most kind of superficially diverse yeah. species on the planet and it is superficial because when you look at the genetics um, chimpanzees who are a much smaller population obviously right. are more genetically diverse than we are wow. as a worldwide really? population wow. of wow. billions um, so that's I mean that's amazing but obviously we are we look more different superficially than, yes. than chimpanzees there's a wonderful book I think it's called James and his friends or um, it's a it's a photographer's um, book of portraits of chimpanzees and it's right. amazing because you start looking and there's loads and loads of portraits of chimpanzees <laughs> right. very close up yeah. um, with ring flashes so you get you know very very beautiful right. um, pin sharp features um, and when you start looking at it you just, another chimpanzee another chimpanzee yeah. and then you actually start looking at their faces and going actually they're all really different yes I bet yeah and they've all got their own kind of characteristics yeah, yeah. And... let's go shopping let's go shopping let's go... No, there's some very, there's quite a few asking if you've got a sister because you're already taken, so you're very popular. Are they? <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, there was a, I don't, I've got a brother, but he's got taken a brother. as well. He's taken as well. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I have a question. What is this weird lump I have right here? <laughs> no, that's fantastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, the first telly you did was, I assume, was Time Team, is that right? Or, yeah. All right. Yeah, so if we go, go, let's go right Go here. right here. So that was, a, that was the first thing I did. I was, a, I was an expert contributor. So, oh, well, actually, initially, I was very much behind the scenes. They were sending me boxes of skeletons to right. report on. So after the event, uh, when they had excavated these bones, they would send them to me and I would, I would write and that a wasn't, And that wasn't filmed? No, uh, no, right. no. Because Time Team, I mean, like any other archaeological excavation, have to produce reports on what they do. Right. Um, and those reports involve a description of the actual excavation itself, but then all right. of those specialist reports, so pottery specialists, coin specialists, and bone specialists, right. all will send in their individual reports and they'll be brought together. So that's what I was doing initially. And then I think it was in 2001, there was a, there was a great big dig um, at a place called Bremer. Um, and it was an Anglo-Saxon burial right. site. And they, so they knew there were going to be lots of bones. Yeah. <clears throat> and they wanted me to come on site and actually start um, washing the bones and looking at them. Right. Um, actually while they were doing them. So I did a bit of excavation and a bit of, of actual sort of processing of the bones as well. When I say processing, it makes it sound splendid and very technically advanced. But it actually <laughs> involves sitting there with a bowl of cold water and a, um, a toothbrush. Right. And <laughs> carefully washing the bones. Yeah. It's one of the really nice things actually about being an academic and working in television is that you, you get sort of opportunities like that, yes. which, are, which yeah. are actually quite academic in a way, but you know, absolutely wonderful. And last year when I did when I did Human Journey, you know, I had I just felt immensely privileged to be able to go and look at fossils and human remains yeah. that I probably would never actually get to look at um, in my professional right. life, in my professional capacity. So um, things like the Hobbit skeleton in, in Indonesia. And I actually laid the hobbit skeleton out, this wow. tiny little creature wow. um, from the island of Flores. And, and that, is was, it of, that was stunning. God, I don't, I don't know, I didn't see that and I don't know anything about that. Is that, was it of humanoid yeah, form? Yeah, it's a really, well it's just bizarre, it sent shivers down my spine, it was just a really, really wow. odd little thing. I'd been following it fairly closely because it had, um, it had, it had kind of hit the news. Uh, when it was first discovered, because it was a new species of human, right? Um, you know, very different from from anything else that had been discovered up to that point. So it was given a new species name, right? And its proper name is Homo floresiensis, which means obviously the Flores man, right? Um, and um, and it's just very, very strange. I mean, the the, the most complete skeleton, the statue would be only a, a, about a meter tall. Wow. So they're tiny, tiny little people, and they have minute brains wow. of about 400 millilitres. Um, as well are ours? About one and a half litres. Right, so yeah, so small. Absolutely minute. Yeah. Um, 
Oh my god, that is spooky then. So, but I mean, yeah, so it yeah. did seem like there was a a group of super small human. Yeah, super small little human human people that aren't the same as us. And what? And what? How long ago? I mean, do you, what was the age of the bones? I mean, do you know? Well, the most recent what? ones. I think. I think the oldest ones went back to almost a hundred thousand years ago, but the right. most recent ones were only twelve thousand years old. So that right. means they were definitely in the area at the same time that modern humans the were modern, in the area. Wow. I don't think we can draw any sort of there is solid some sort of weird race memory it. going yeah. back forty thousand years. Yeah, because yeah. otherwise there would be leprechauns and fairies. And, you know. yeah, I still like to think there's some leprechauns <laughs> around. I know that we've not got any archaeological evidence that t Tony Robinson's found. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I occasionally th I occasionally do see some little people in my garden. Tiny little people, just with very small. Gold. The tiny yeah. little wheelbarrow, because I hear the little squeak as it walks there. <laughs> They steal one of my beetroot. Really? <laughs> well, actually, I think it was a rabbit. Because <laughs> I don't have an academic background, so you've got, you know, you, I'm very envious of you because you've actually got something to stand on to go, all right, well, the reason this happens, the yeah. reason there's lumps on this shin bone is because, da da da, you know, you know where I go. You, I mean, you know, as an academic, your field of knowledge is, is very it's, narrow. It's quite I, mean, narrow I think, I think, I think yeah. it's interesting as a scientist that you, you know, that I think non scientists think that all scientists understand each other. But we don't, yeah. you know. And if I if I talk to a physicist, I'm as clueless as anybody. Yes, you know, I can. Well, I can imagine that because I, because I, 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 you know, uh, Professor Brian Cox. Have you heard of him? Yes. Him? Yeah. Well, no, I, guess I, I, I carpooled with yeah. him, and I mean, you know, I actually think that if you'd been driving and he'd been talking, you probably wouldn't have understand much more than I did, because <laughs> I didn't understand a lot. There was, I was quite good with some of it. I was really trying hard, yeah. and it shows. It's very cruel. It shows no, on my face. I think this, um, I'm, I'm quite happy with medicine because I mean, at the end of the day. It's all, I mean, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot yeah, of it. Gosh, yeah. But none of it is particularly difficult conceptually. So it's right. not, I don't think it's like um, maths and physics where yeah. it really kind of hurts your brain to think about it. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, medicine is, is kind of, you know, it's kind of plumbing and, um, you know, just the way things are put together. It's engineering yeah. and plumbing. It is, and, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's, all, it's all sort of concepts that are fairly graspable. Yeah. Whereas, yes, when Brian Cox started to describe uh, hydrogen under such pressure that it turns into a liquid metal, mm. you go, oh, it's kind of what does that mean? <laughs> the, Richard, Richard Dawkins um, talks about um, sort of things that you can understand on an intuitive level and then things which actually you don't understand because you have to understand them as, or you have to use abstract concepts. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he talks about things which are... Um, I'm you know, guessing right, left, right. That yeah. is left, yeah. right. I'm, I'm guessing so, completely wrong. You know, once yeah. you get to kind of fractions of a millimetre, and, and yes. then once you're sort of talking about things which are you know completely invisible to the naked yeah. eye, yeah. you have to look at use electron microscopes to look at them. It's very, very difficult to actually conceptualise how big those are. You don't actually have a yeah. visceral feeling of how big no. they are. And similarly, when you're talking about the universe, it's very different. I mean, yeah. You know, it's, I can understand what a mile is, and I can understand what a hundred miles is. Yeah. A thousand miles starts to be one of those kind of abstract things, and as soon as you get a bit further than that, yeah. it's sort of. I think I'm even all right with like the, how far the moon is away. That's quite. A, that's lots of miles. Yeah, I've got, but I can understand have a feeling that. Of that rather than yes, I feel I do. Well, because I know because I've seen somewhere it would take you two and a half years to drive there in a car. You know, yes, so you kind so of go, it's okay, it's a easy. bloody long way. Yeah. <laughs> I think a but lot then, of understanding in science, well, and, and across the board is. is it's when it's, it's, yes, it's, it's when it's easy. broken down to those metaphors, but then light years, you just go, well, because we were looking for the shooting stars right, with my kids the other night. Yeah. We didn't see any because it was, I don't know, too many clouds, but we did see stars, and I was talking about how the light from those stars happened thousands of years yeah. ago. And then you go, and then, the, the, which, you know, you can do that as like sort of page one of a crap dictionary, then your child asks you why. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you yes. A fucking clue. No. Yes. <laughs> Completely hopeless. I'm I don't really know why. Hoping. Next, oh, next right here. Oh, is this one yeah. here? Tucked away. So we've done a little trip to the farm shop and bought some yes, free-range, no, free yeah, free-range range sausages. Yeah, you bought free-range free sausages, sausages and I bought hideously factory farmed pork pie <laughs> where the, cat, the pigs were kept in small plastic boxes oh. and beaten. Got some nice cheese as well. <laughs> and some biscuits, very importantly. Well, thank you very good much, Alison. It was very good of you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Nice it's been an absolute lunch. joy. No, thank very you. good. Do you think it's conceivable that we could, we couldn't generate all the electricity we needed through wind alone, presumably, or do you think it is possible? Right. There's enough wind to power the country three or four times over.
the switch and wind it up. It is extraordinary. So who said electric cars were quiet? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. All that nonsense about 